Mark, the 10th chapter. We'll be reading verses 46 and on. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And so they called to the blind men, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, Jesus said. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Please be seated. Father, we come this morning again celebrating your boundless grace and your boundless love, asking in that way that we have experienced grace from our Savior, that your Spirit would tremendously change our lives, recreating us in the image of Christ Jesus, so that we may be ambassadors of your boundless grace and love. So grateful, Heavenly Father, that you did not leave us without a witness, but you gave to us your scriptures, through which we see the testimonies of men and women who have followed you and have called you Father, Lord, Savior, and have put themselves at your disposal. May we, as we read, Heavenly Father, and as we study, our lives be so changed that we fall within that great cloud of witness, bearing grace and testimony to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and allowing his grace to flow through us to bless others. Father, we pray that your spirit would attend us today as your word is preached, that even in the poor, fallible words of a preacher, the the words of life may be found. For we ask it in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. Don't you want to see Bartimaeus and go, you did it. Look what you did, Bartimaeus. You know, the shot that was heard around the world. We don't know who the fellow was that pulled the trigger, but we know who pulled this one, Bartimaeus. Do you understand what he did? Do you you understand that this is where Palm Sunday begins? It begins with a blind man who saw something nobody else saw. It begins with Bartimaeus and Bartimaeus' declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of David. Nowhere in Mark do you find that title of appellation given to Jesus except here. It was Bartimaeus, you son of a gun. You saw it. Nobody else saw it. You did it. You started the triumphal procession. I would imagine Barnabas would say, wait a minute, don't get too carried away here because we know where the triumphal procession led. It led to the cross. Don't don't blame me for that. And we would say, no, we don't blame you for that. But we do thank you for recognizing who Jesus Christ was, the son of David, who came to fulfill what Israel failed to do, to become the Israel of God. And in that moment, to take upon himself the vocation of Israel, and so doing through his death and resurrection, blessing the world as he is lifted up, he draws all to him, all those who come by faith. Were it not for Jesus Christ and what he accomplished, we wouldn't gather in his name this morning. It would still be trapped in an old religion, but not in a dynamic living faith that comes to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember, if you will, Bartimaeus can only take partial credit for it because Jesus has already, in the last 
portion of the 10th chapter, set his face to Jerusalem. He is going to Jerusalem to give his life as a ransom for many. He is going to Jerusalem to put an end to sin and death and hell. He is going to bring about a new redemption, a new creation, a new freedom from captivity. Jesus is going to Jerusalem not on the Day of Atonement, my friends, nor is he going on the Day of Booths or the Festival of Booths. He's going on Passover. Do you remember what happened at Passover? The nation of Israel cried out after 400 and some odd years of slavery that they were tired of being slaves. They needed the deliverance. Their taskmasters were so harsh to them. Could you not, God, deliver your people from the hand of the Egyptians, from the house of captivity, from the bondage of Egypt, from Pharaoh? And God sent Moses who said, let my people go. Do you remember that? How the plagues started. Each plague a contest over who is God in Israel. God controlled both heaven and earth. And he was able in those plagues to overwhelm the deities of Egypt. And Pharaoh kept saying he was son he was God. And then the tenth plague came. You're to take a lamb and you're to mark the doorpost. And when I see the blood of the lamb, I will pass over you. But the firstborn of every house, even Pharaoh, will be taken. And from this day on, you are to redeem your children with the blood of a lamb. For the firstborn belongs to me, says the Lord God. And on that terrible night, the angel of death passed over. And even Pharaoh's house was touched. Who is God in Egypt? There is only one God. He has proved himself to be Lord of creation, Lord of heaven and earth, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb that will be slain at this Passover. Not because Pharaoh has kept Israel captive, but because our own sins have kept us captive. The old philosopher said this, Whoever can set us free from ourselves and our sins will truly be the Prince of Peace. For wars can cease, but the war within the heart rages on and on and on. And only until that is satisfied can there truly be peace. Oh, we know a Prince of Peace, do we not? One who had loved us and gave himself to us who finally brought the war that rages in our hearts to an end. It was because of his great love for us. It was because of his great grace toward us. He took and nailed our sins to the cross at Calvary and there to be remembered no more. Do you remember that great story? This is something that I read every Good Friday. I love to read Pilgrim's Progress. It's a great story, written by a good Baptist. Bunyan says that Christian was so burdened with this terrible weight on his back, his wife couldn't help him with it, his children couldn't help him with it, the neighbors couldn't help him with it. When the evangelist came through and began to talk about sin and, and the need to be forgiven, Bunyan said Christian just couldn't get this burden off his back and so he runs and he runs to the gate and he opens the gate and he begins the travels and the burden stays with him until he comes to a hill called Calvary. And as he drops to his knees, 
The picture is the burden rolls off and drops into the pit and is gone forever. Oh, don't you remember the first time that God's grace fell into your lives and he so touched you and moved you that you knew at that moment I was forgiven. My sins are held no longer against me. I am freed in Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, blessed Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Sometimes we fail to remember those days. Sometimes it's a vague memory, but every day is supposed to be a day in which we enter into the grace of God through our Savior Jesus Christ and experience the testimony of his spirit who bears witness with our spirit that we are his children, loved and beloved. So what do we worry about tomorrow? For we know who holds it. And he has promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. Oh, the salvation we talk about is nothing to be so quickly dismissed. It has to be lifted up. All right, let me get on with the sermon. Bartimaeus that morning got up like he did every morning. He uh, probably rolled up his bed or folded it up best he could. Probably had an egg or something like that to eat in the morning and then called for either a young boy or a servant or somebody in the household to lead him down to the gate because he's going to sit at the gate and he's going to tell everybody he's a sinner. You see, he's blind. And blindness is God's curse on his life. Somewhere in his life, or as he believed, Maybe not my life, but my family's life. Somewhere, you know, that fourth uncle, it's his fault. But somewhere we need to blame somebody for bringing disgrace to the name Timaeus. And now I am touched with blindness and I can't see. And so the boy would have led him down to the gate. And there he would have cried out, have mercy on me. You see, he can't go up to Jerusalem to ask for forgiveness. He's not allowed in the temple. He is physically challenged. And so he has to stay outside. And he has to rely on the goodness of those who go to temple to come back and to show mercy to him. Since God has shut that door, others have to show kindness to me. And so every day he is dependent upon the goodness of his neighbors and friends. And he would sit at the gate and he would spread out his robe so that it formed a, a, or his cloak, he would put on his lap so it formed a basket. And as people would go by, they would throw something into the basket and he would say, bless you. Thank you. May God have mercy on you for your kindness that you've shown to me a sinner. Can you imagine having to sit down every day to earn your bread and tell everybody how big of a sinner you are? Now maybe some of us, like Bartimaeus, would say, well, it's really not me. You know, it's not, I'm not that kind of person. My family, oh, you ought to know, you ought to know them people. You wouldn't believe what I was raised with. You know, we'd like to be able to push that off on somebody else. It's one of the great gifts that human being has. They have the ability to lie. Well, it's not me. You know how I know this? It gets celebrated almost every day on TV. I didn't say that. What do you mean I didn't say that? We can go back and get the videotape. You said that. Deception. Pushing it along. Most of us don't have to face that. Most of us can kind of avoid it. If we know somebody who knows our sin, we try to skirt around it so we don't have to face them. But behind Barnabas, he had to face it every day. He had to sit there and cry out, telling everybody about what he or his family did. Isn't it funny how Mark starts this journey to Jericho? You remember Jericho, don't you? 
Jericho was the first city. Do you remember what happened in Jericho? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Well, that's not quite true. God fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Jo Joshua did what God told him to do and that was to be faithful and go around the city, remember, seven times and then blow the horn and shout and God would deliver the city. Do you remember that story? That was the first city given in the new promised land. I hope that your Old Testament understandings and your New Testament understandings are starting to line up here. Because Jericho is the first city in which Jesus is named Son of David. It's the first city in the new redemption. It's the first city of the new Jerusalem. It's the first city of the new promised land. See, Jesus Christ is going to fulfill for us the new heaven and new earth. And in Jesus Christ, we are going to begin to live out what it means to be in Christ so that others might see Christ living in us and give glory to God, for he has indeed touched our lives. He has changed us. We're no longer the same. And as Jesus is coming through Jericho, now if you read Luke, you know that Zacchaeus fits in here somewhere. But Mark says, that's, well, that's a detail I don't need to get into because the real story is Bartimaeus. So he goes, right from Jesus walked in and as he's walking out, as he's walking out, there's a crowd with him. And I can imagine that Bartimaeus said to the person sitting next to him, what's going on? What do you see? There's a crowd coming. Well, what are they saying? Well, they're talking about this prophet from Nazareth. His name is Jesus. And as that crowd begins to come closer and closer, I don't know what it was that clicked. I don't know what happened to make Bartimaeus figure that Jesus Christ was the son of David, and when the son of David showed up, the, 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 the redemption and the freedom from captivity would ensue. The blind would see, according to Isaiah. The lame would walk. There would be grace and mercy shown. Sins would be forgiven. And the new Jerusalem would come. I'd love to believe that he that morning had no idea, but when he heard Jesus of Nazareth and heard what he had done for Zacchaeus and heard what he had done in his ministry, he naturally just jumped over here. But so often, we become vessels of the Holy Spirit who prompts us to say and do things that we don't have any idea what it's going to cause or do, but we want to be faithful. And so he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Nobody's equated Jesus with the son of David except at his birth. But from the time of Nazareth on, they haven't talked about him as son of David, son of God, son from heaven, uh, son of man. Son of David is a royal title that God is filling the promises to David, that one who would be faithful would sit on his throne forever, and that is Jesus Christ. And Bartimaeus saw it, and he began to scream. Isn't it interesting to people when someone he cries out for mercy says, oh, be quiet. He don't want nothing to do with you. What, is it, what, is, what does the son of David have to do with sinners? Just be quiet. We don't take those type in here. They don't belong here. We're a nice group of people. Who are they? Shush up. It's a time of celebration. You're just going to bring it down. Whenever someone tells you that Jesus doesn't want anything to do with you, you cry out louder. Hear me? You cry out louder. Because the saints know that we're all Bartimaeuses and we all cried out for the mercy of God 
and he heard our plea. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Don't let someone tell you Jesus is too busy for you. That's why he came, for you. Don't let Jesus or anybody tell you the master has other things on his mind. He has you on his mind. Don't let anybody say, oh, no, 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 no. You are not worth it. For God came to claim his image. We were created in the image of God and by grace we're recreated in Christ's image. Please be the kind of people that when friends and neighbors say, I'm not worth anything, you tell them in Christ's eyes, you are God's valued possession, that he came even for you. Isn't that the testimony of the church? One beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Or in this case, one blind man telling another blind man where he can receive sight. It is in Jesus Christ. He cried out even louder. When Jesus heard him, he says, bring him to me. Oh, cheer up, they say. Pop, pop, cheer up. He's calling you. There's almost a patronizing in that, isn't there? Oh yeah, he wants to talk to you because you were yelling. You interrupted the per parade. There's almost like a triteness. What could he possibly want with you? But I want you to see something that Bartimaeus did. That when Jesus says your faith made you well, you can say, uh-huh. Let's see what you can see. Jesus calls him. And what does he do with his cloak with all the money in it? Not going to need this no more. If you were dependent on those alms to get through your day, you would have scooped them up and put them in your pocket and then threw off the cloak. But if the son of David will speak the word, I'll never have to sit here again. Do you hear that? If the son of David speaks the word, I'll never have to sit and beg again. No longer am I going to have to tell everybody I'm a sinner. I'll be saved by grace. And then I can tell the story of how Jesus saved me from my sin. And that I'm not what I once was. That I have been freed. If you had to give up your livelihood to meet the Savior, would you do it? Many of us have. Many of us said, from now on, I'm not going to be a plant worker. From now on, I'm going to be a Christian plant worker. I'm not going to be a farmer no more. I'm going to be a Christian farmer. I'm not going to be a businessman. I'm going to be a Christian businessman. I'm going to live my life so that Jesus Christ gets the testimony of what he's done for me. What do you want me to do for you? Like he had to ask that question. Like there was not already a conversation that was going on between Bartimaeus and Jesus. The minute he heard those coins fly onto the ground and someone pushed him forward, you knew what the answer is. There's something about Jesus loves to hear us ask him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to be free from my sins. I no longer want to be the person that I become. I want to be the person you want me to become. I want to be freed from this. I don't want this life no more. I only want what you have for me and to be able to live my life freely in your grace and love so that others might see Christ living in me. Well, go ahead. Your faith has saved you. It's amazing, isn't it, how disobedient Christians are? Go! And Barnabas says, go where? I'm going with you. I'm following you. Isn't that what we all do? 
Jesus said, now that your grace has saved you, you can do anything you want. Some folks would say, I'm going to Disneyland. But that's not the answer. The answer is, where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him all the way. My heart aches when I think about that. Just as your heart aches. Because in order for Bartimaeus to see his sight, he's going to have to go with Jesus. And you know where Jesus is going, don't you? He's going to a cross. If anyone is to come and follow me, Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That for each of us, no longer do we live to ourself, but we join that great band of obedience that began with our Savior, so that we are not the same. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture, and we follow him wherever he leads. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, take us as we are. We can never be any better than we are. We are who we are, and we long to be who you want us to be freed from sin, freed from self, freed to follow you wherever you lead us and guide us. It is because of your steadfast love to us that we have come to experience grace upon grace. No one has ever loved us as you have loved us. No one has ever given their life for us as you have given your life for us. And so we pray this day, Heavenly Father, May your life so animate our lives that others only see Jesus living in us. For we ask it in your son's name and for his sake. Amen.